Now this is Bruce, Professor Bruce Robinson, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce him to you a little bit more fully now. Now, Bruce is a sort of humble, sort of self-deprecating sort of guy, hates speaking about this sort of thing, so I'm going to talk about it to him and at him (laughs) and also to you guys, just to really help us all uh, just sort of place him in our mind's eye, if you like. So this this is a little bit of who Bruce is. Here we go. Number one. So Bruce is a professor of medicine. Uh, He's a consultant physician in lung diseases at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. He's the winner of um, numerous and very prestigious scientific awards. Uh, He's the chair of the State Health Research Advisory Council. Uh, He's the co-founder and the director of the National Centre for Asbestos-Related Diseases. He's the co-founder and the director of the International Skills and Training Institute in... I'm running out of breath here, Bruce, so I'm just going to take another (laughs) breath. In health... Uh, These guys train people um, in particularly for and ready for disaster situations in the Asian region. Uh, He also happens to speak Indonesian and also French. Uh, Do we have any Indonesian speakers here today? Great. Now, we're just going to test Bruce out to make sure that this is legitimate, okay? Can you greet him and we'll see what happens, shall we? Kabar baik. Terima kasih. Dan anda bagaimana kabar? (laughs) <laughs> okay. That sounded pretty legitimate to me. He could also get along in Italian as well, and amazingly speaks what many may know as a Papua New Guinean or Tok Pisin or Tok Pigeon, um, which is amazing as well. I mean, I, there's not that many people I think who would do that, but you do. Let me have a Tok Pigeon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stop swearing at me, would you? No. Anyway, he also um, is a a dad, so he's a dad to Scott and Simon and Amy, um, husband to Jackie, uh, director of the Fathering Project, which you're going to hear a little bit about today, Uh, a very passionate follower of Jesus, uh, but also was in 2013 the Western Australian of the Year, which I reckon is worth a bit of applause. And then in 2014 was a finalist in the Australian of the Year, And we reckon he should have pulled it off, but we reckon he should have pulled it off, but unfortunately they gave it to some footballer from Sydney named Adam Goods, who's a really great guy. Yeah, he's just a slightly better footballer than me, that's why he won it. (laughs) (laughs) So, welcome to Bruce. Why don't we put hands together and say welcome. Very good. Now, Bruce, there's sort of, there's different parts of you and they're all fully integrated. Uh, There's like the working part of you, the medical part of you and so on, the professor of medicine and the leader of this large research um, team. Now, give us an idea, just to just paint the picture for us, what exactly the research team looks into, uh, because we've often heard words like asbestosis, um, mesothelioma, asbestos disease, all of that sort of thing. Just tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Sure. Yeah. um so with our research, we're trying basically to um, make an impact on... Actually, I think I'm making a bit of a scratchy noise here, I'm sorry. Trying to make an impact on cancer. Um, asbestos-induced cancers are quite common in Australia, and particularly in Western Australia. So mesothelioma is a cancer, whereas asbestosis is the uh, scar tissue caused by asbestos. Um, it's a, not a very nice cancer, mesothelioma, and... You know, I used to see these patients and, to be honest, we just sent them home to die. Just nothing could be done. So I already had a doctorate in research, so um, I decided to have a go at trying to make an impact. And it's turned into this whole world-leading thing. Uh, 30 people working there, brilliant people. Very exciting research. Mm. Now, I know some people in this room and maybe listening on television or watching online or whatever uh, may have been aware there's a very, very public face to this. It was a person who actually passed away from this terrible disease by the name of Bernie Banton. And you actually were a friend of Bernie's. Yeah, I knew Bernie and a very close friend of his widow, Karen. In fact, I'm a founding director of the Bernie Banton Foundation. Um, Interestingly, um, Bernie and Karen are Christians. And it's always a mystery to people. Um, I mean, he's a guy who's out there fighting for the rights of people who have got asbestos-induced diseases and boom, like lightning, he gets mesothelioma and dies. He's a Christian man. How can God let this happen? But yeah, fabulous people. Mm. 
We were chatting earlier that um, we've got a mutual friend and this disease has touched many people in many ways, directly and indirectly. One of them was a friend of mine and of Bruce's, a guy by the name of Dr. Graham Johnston. He was the um, Senior Minister of Subiaco Church of Christ, which is a fantastic church here in the city of Perth, Western Australia. And I still remember the day uh, I was having coffee with Graham and at the time I was with another good friend of mine, in fact the predecessor as Senior Minister in this church, Phil Baker. And Phil Baker was still in recovery and still is recovering, but he was coming out of a very big health challenge himself. And the three of us were thinking he was the sickest person there, but none of us knew that Graham actually at that point was the sickest person because as we're having coffee, Graham's sitting to my right and he kept sort of moving his left shoulder like this. And eventually I said, what's the matter? And he goes, I've done something to my left shoulder. It's really sore. I'm getting it scanned this week. And I remember a little bit later on, he rang me to tell me what had happened. They'd scanned the shoulder and the scan had actually cut across a bit of his left lung. And then in, when they were looking at it, um, they looked at the structure of the shoulder and the shoulder looked fine. And then the doctor looked down at his lung and sort of put his finger and said, what's that? And that's where it all started. And in the end, Bruce, you were actually directly involved in what happened then. Yeah, I actually uh, was the one that had to um, organise the biopsy and actually had to break the bad news to Graham and to Tracy that he only had about six months to live. Um, and this is, um, you know, this is a, a mystery to people. You know, you had these two wonderful pastors, Phil Baker here and Graham Johnson in Subiaco, pastors, wonderfully gifted young men both stricken with severe illnesses. How can God allow this to happen? It seemed almost amazing, Hayden, that it was happening at the same time. You know, like God was saying, hey, you know, it's not all about you. There's, some, there's a mystery to this. Mm. But, yeah, to, to sit there and break the bad news to Graham, as it is, it is one of my jobs. I mean, I'm a lung specialist, and a lot of people get lung cancer and mesothelioma, and I have to sit there and break the bad news to men and women often with their partner sitting with them, holding hands and crying. It's a very poignant part of my life. Have you found that what's the best approach in doing something as tough as that? Yeah, I don't think I did a very good job of this when I was a young consultant. In fact, I know I didn't do a good job of it as a young consultant, and nor do a lot of doctors. Um, so I read up about it and learned about it. Um, well, the key things are to be clear, to make sure you create a space and time. Don't tell them over the phone or on a ward round. Use body language that's kind, you know, eye level and hold their hand or whatever and um, be clear about it. You know, ask them what they want to know. Ask them what they want to know rather than deciding what they want to know. Um, but in, in all of this, it's crucial to be moved with compassion, to speak with compassion and to be moved with compassion. I mean, people dying of cancer can get the bad news in bad ways. I mean, people here may have even experienced that themselves and it can create a lot of bitterness. But I think a doctor has a responsibility but also a privilege of being invited into people's inner sanctum and to break the bad news well and then to carry on on the journey of, you know, I shouldn't say journey of life, it's the journey to death of people and to essentially hold their hand and walk that journey with them is, a, is a quite a profound privilege. And there's a way to do that part of it well as also so that they die well and there's a way to do it badly so they die lonely or bitter. I know at one stage you would often sometimes mention to them, because sometimes the, the, the time it may take would differ. It could be three months, could be yeah. 12. Yeah, so I have a, a very direct approach about this, which I'll tell you about, because it, uh, you might find it helpful. Um, people feel pretty uncomfortable talking about dying, um, and they feel pretty uncomfortable with someone who's dying. And often people who are dying, they don't have any visitors at home because people are so uncomfortable, they don't call in. I'm different, I'm quite direct. So I have a phrase that I use and it says, uh, plan, for the, plan for the worst but hope for the best. So if it's three months or 12 months, I say, by all means, hope for the 12 months. Or even a miracle, it's God can do miracles, you know. But we all know that he doesn't normally, so in that situation, but hope for the 12 months. But here's the thing, and this is the liberating thing. Plan for the worst. Plan for the three months. What does that mean? If you and your wife have always wanted to go to Paris, go to Paris now. And here's the thing. You've got a couple of teenage daughters. We start right, think about it. Write a letter to them. Write a letter telling them about how wonderful they are and your hopes and dreams and aspirations for them. You know, you're not going to walk them down the aisle. 
Amazing. So, so once people do this, I mean, their tears fall on the page. But it liberates them. It liberates them. From then on, they are liberated. And every day is a gift. The sky is bluer than they've ever noticed before and the leaves on the trees are greener. They've never noticed that before and every day is a gift. So in the process of showing compassion, which I feel is the compassion of Jesus in my heart, uh, it's wonderful to see how you can help people on that journey to death. I mean, we're all going to die and we've all got loved ones. I and mean, it is the most intimate touching thing that I do in my, in my work. And uh, people say it must be awful. And I say, no, it's actually a privilege and an honour to be with people on that journey. I know. That, I mean, the Indonesian connection, the fact that you speak Indonesian now, came about also through a, a, another event, this time a large-scale event, where a lot of people uh, underwent suffering. Just tell us a little bit about how that came about. Yeah, so I, when the tsunami hit Indonesia, I didn't uh, volunteer. There uh, were 3,000 people who were dead, and I thought that's terrible. And I went camping, actually on a beach mission where we go every year. And the death toll got to 60,000, and I felt terribly moved, as everyone did. And then the ABC did a report of all these kids who'd become orphans because kids can swim and they hang on to trees and things, and then they, the, the water finally receded. They went back to their village or the area, and everyone was dead. Grandma, grandpa, every because they all live in the same area and they couldn't swim. And I just wept, sat on my camp stretcher and wept. So uh, because I have training in that area, I volunteered. And you think about it, if you went to Cottesloe and looked north, you would actually, if the earth wasn't curved, you would see the coast of Sumatra. You would see the destruction. And let me tell you, it is horrible. It is awesome and horrible. Anyway, I volunteered. I ended up on a team of 120 Indonesians and one big, tall, white guy. <laughs> and that's why I learned Indonesian, because it's sink or swim. Uh, and uh, it is pretty visceral, pretty hard work. And, you know, I did look after these sort of kids. And hearing their stories, I mean, I wept. I wept. And similar stories, where the kids lost their parents, or parents have lost all of their kids. Every single child. One dad lost his wife and all three daughters. Just walking around like a zombie. I mean, this cannot but touch your heart. So, and I've been back many times and helped and we did form that organisation that you said in order to train people to be ready for the next disaster. I think your heart, um, that sort of, I suppose, started to, I don't know, it wasn't rediscovered, but it started to grow, this idea of this heart for the next generation and how important it is. In fact, I was reading during the week, Mark McCrindle, he does a, he's a follower of Jesus, I've met this guy, and he does amazing research into society in Australia, and he just noted during the week that there's a baby boom on, 310,000 babies per annum are being born at the moment in Australia. It's amazing, isn't it? When you think about it, a bit of a baby boom going. Now, I know as you, as you were growing up, you sort of, you had a bit of a heart for the next generation and so on. You're into football, I know that. Tell us a little bit about your experiences there. I mean, you were playing and coaching. Yeah, well, when I was a kid, I grew up in Bassendine, which is factory, working class factory suburb, wherever it is out there. I can't even remember which direction it is now. Um, <laughs> Um, and really all I wanted to do was to play league football for Swan District, which is the local team. And, uh, but I didn't play football for Swan District, and you might think because I became a busy doctor. No, it's because I wasn't good enough. <laughs> Actually, I did play one league game, but um, I was pretty much a reserves player. But you know, um, my best fun uh, really was, uh, was playing. I loved playing, but I had six years of coaching. I coached at the University Football Club, initially the A Colts and then the uh, A grade won a few premierships and had just the most fabulous time. And those young men, they're almost like sons to me. I see them and, I, you know, we did a lot of hugs and, you know, great to see you. It's a great relationship and I, I did love it. Because you would sometimes end up saying, hey, I want to be, in a sense, more than a coach and more, about, more than just the football game. And I think you kicked off having some, what was it, dinners, yeah. I think, or something. Yeah, so what happened, Aidan, was... Um, actually, I was sitting in church one day having communion and I thought... I don't want to over-spiritualise it, but I thought, you know, communion is such an intense moment when you think that God treats us as really special. Like all these people here, all unique and special people, and God sees the uniqueness and special. And I thought, I am treating these players like my players. I want them to feel special. So I went home and spoke to my wife and we organised these dinners. So let's say there's 28 in the squad or so. There's a, like, I decided to get them around in groups of four. 
And they would come around for a three-course meal to our house, which Jackie would cook, which is obviously why I asked her permission. Um, <laughs> nice bottle of wine, open fire, and here's the thing. Talk about football was forbidden. We only talked about them, you know. What are you studying? What are you interested in? Tell us about your family. Just to make them feel special. And now we have reunions, and they don't come up to me and say, I'll never forget that grand final, the bus trip, etc. They say, Bruce, I'll never forget those dinners. They say, how's Jackie? I'll never forget those dinners at your place and how special they made me feel. And it, it struck me um, in that whole process about how when you're coaching and any form of mentoring, school teacher or even with your nephews and nieces, you know, people who aren't your kids, they're like in your hand like that, particularly coaching or teaching. They're in your hand and you can really influence them. I didn't actually realise that at the time. If I'd known back then how much those young men were watching me in my role as a husband and a dad, I'm not sure I would have agreed. I knew I wasn't such a great husband and, and dad. But they were watching. They got, they got their radar out to see how I'm going. And uh, they've told me that. Oh, I've learned that since then. You have them in your hand, and it's such a responsibility. And with the fathering project, you know, we really do try to teach men not just to be better dads, but to be better father figures, no matter what other kids are in your orbit. And that, yeah, that was a, turned out to be a great um, thrill, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to God that he that laid it on my heart at that moment in, you know, really a special kind of touch. Mm. So some of this ended up you, you writing this book, which really kicked things off, this fathering from the fast lane, practical ideas for busy dads. You ended up interviewing over 75 dads, in fact, over 400 people, because there was often wives and family involved as well. And what I might do, I was looking in the early stages, and you've got in the preface all the names, and these people are actually friends of yours, and some names leap out, they're well-known figures. I might throw some at you sure, and just ahead, see what man. you think. So let's kick off with this one, John Anderson, the former Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah, John, um, absolutely fantastic bloke. Uh, one of the most humble, least affected people. He was Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. And we became friends through that process. I used to phone him when he was acting Prime Minister, when John Howard was away. He'd be up on the farm, we'd just sit there having a chat. I mean, um, great dad, a great dad. And uh, he didn't know that I was a Christian. I didn't know he was a Christian. Um, but we pretty soon related in that regard. But he said something to me which I'm always impressed with. He told me what he did as a dad. And I wrote it all down because that's what I was doing. But he said this. You know, Bruce, I'm just telling you what I think I do well, but maybe my kids don't agree, and I know you come to Canberra for work. Why don't you come around and, and interview my kids and just to see if what I'm saying is true, because they might think I'm a lousy dad. I thought, that's honesty. <laughs> brilliant guy, brilliant guy, and he's been a great supporter of the Fathering Project, and he's become a very close friend. Here's another one, Tim Winton, the famous Australian author. Um, Belinda and I were actually friends with Tim's sister, Sharon, um, and his dad used to be a chief inspector of police over me, and everyone was petrified of Chief Inspector Winton. So, um, but you know Tim, and you had a chat with him. I mean, this is the author of Cloud Street and a range of other books and so on. Yeah, no, T Tim's an old, uh, an old friend. Um, you know, slightly reclusive guy in a lot of ways, Tim, and uh, doesn't like a lot of uh, attention. Um, but he's a great guy. I like Tim a lot. And he's got an unusual way of thinking. If you've read Tim's books, which obviously a lot of people have, uh, you'll see that he has an unusual way of thinking, but he's just the most wonderful dad. Because he wrote a lot at home, he had often had the kids on his, you know, carrying the kids around, changing nappies and things like that, so he's very close and connected to his three kids, still is. Um, also, Tim had some great ideas, and in, in the book there, there's a photo of Tim in Paris with Harry, one of his kids, standing in front of Notre Dame. The thing is that Tim hated all that travel and all that fuss, you know, book tours and launches, hated it. And he took his kids with him on these trips. And uh, this is uh, brilliant. This is brilliant. You know, uh, taking a kid on a trip, work trip or any other trip. He took them one at a time, so he didn't have Denise with him, just him and just one of the kids. And this has turned out to be a, a big win. In fact, there's a whole chapter on there, Hayden. There's a chapter on uh, taking your kids on trips. And I say that because, um, because I went to a conference and someone had read that chapter. And he had a 14-year-old daughter I'll never forget this. I remember exactly where I was standing. He had a 14 year old daughter. And he actually came running up to me because he was waiting for me to tell me this story. He said, I read that chapter in your book about work trips, the Tim Winton trick. He said, my 14 year old daughter and I were like this. 
as can sometimes happen, um, with four and your old girls. Um, so I said, do you want to come to Paris with me on this trip? And anyway, she went five days conference with Dad, and then they had a week together or so. And he said to me, and this is the reason he came running up to me, he said, now we're like this. We are like this. Just like that. If he hadn't done the trip, they would still be like that. And he said, I overheard her talking to her friends, and she said to her friends, well, it might have been her mum, sorry, I can't remember exactly who it was he overheard. But she said, they were the best two weeks of my life. And then he stood there and he paused and he sort of tilted his head. And you know what, Bruce, he said, they were the best two weeks of my life as well. Mm. They, it is such a brilliant tip to take your kids. And here's the, here's the key point, Hayden, mm. one on one. It's not him and his mate, it's not him and his wife, and it's not him with three kids. He takes them one at a time. One-on-one -on -one events between a dad and a child are like magic. Dates or trips, they are like magic. Tim Winton discovered that, worked really well. My friend in Sydney discovered it. I bet him and his daughter are still like that. And if you, you, know, if you can create those one-on-one -on -one times, and I'll tell you why it works. People think, oh, you get time to talk to him. Rubbish. Those kids won't go, I made this mistake once, like one of my many hundreds of mistakes deciding that this one-on-one -on -one dad thing was a good idea and I'd go out and talk to my kids and do this sort of thing. That does not work. They will never go out with you again. <laughs> At the Fathering Project, we say, when you go out for, on a dad date with your kids, take a little detour to Bunnings, buy a tube of superglue and... <laughs> so that when you get, as dads, honestly dads, let's face it, we are problem solvers and we want to jump in and fix the problem before we've even heard it. We're not good listeners. I've asked lots of dads. I've asked probably 5,000 dads if you're a good listener to your wife or kids, and maybe 20 have put their hands up. I love that vision of you know, people having super glued lips. So as you're trying to jump in and solve the kids' problems, you're, you can't do it. Uh, so I, I made that mistake too. Going out, just listening to your kids, and it makes the kids feel worthwhile. If there was one thing, one thing that would stop kids becoming drug addicts, etc., is that when they're teenagers and they're out there and people are offering them drugs, they would be able to say, you know what, I don't need it. I feel worthwhile already. I feel OK already, so I'll just pass. I'll just pass. To feel worthwhile. And if you as a dad spend one-on-one -on -one time with your kids, they say, you know what, my dad's really busy. And he's willing to spend time with me. I must be worth spending time with. I must be worthwhile. It's as simple as that. That is why it is so magic. From this to this. So I noticed one of your books was, you know, daughters and their dads, daughters and their, because there's a uniqueness to that relationship. And there's tips for fathers, adult daughters, husbands, father figures. And I noticed this one as well, the blue book of tips for fathers and father figures, but obviously a bit of a difference there. Yeah, well, let me just mention this one, because lots of women in the room, and they'll, they'll know this straight away, that the relationship between a father and his daughter has a profound effect for good or bad or some sort of complicated mixture. So this is actually written for fathers who have got daughters. Just put your hand up here if you're a... Who's got, put your hand up if you've got a daughter. I should put my hand up too, yes. Dads have no idea what to do with their daughters. <laughs> you know, you say, what do, you, what do daughters need as distinct from sons? No dad can give you the answer. So I wrote this book, but it's also a book for adult daughters because they've been so profoundly affected, including in their marriage, which is why it's also for husbands. If you don't understand your wife's relationship with her dad, you will never understand her, guys. And father figures, like I got nieces, right? So that's why I wrote this. But you're right. Look at the size of this book, right? 200 and whatever it's 60, 90 pages. Hey, blokes don't read books. How brutal is this? I've written a bunch of them and blokes don't even read them. But they're all bestsellers, so I want to know who's buying them. Turns out, <laughs> turns out women buy them and they just slip them in the Christmas stocking and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but at the Fathering Project, we wanted something for blokes to read. So, And guys, I'm not being derogatory, because I was the same. I said to my wife, you read the book and tell me what I need to know. <laughs> so we decided to write a book for dads. This is how thick it is. <laughs> this is how big it is. And uh, it's only got 31 pages. And it's written in dot point form. <laughs> so, um, blokes call this the Dunny book, because that's where it sits in the Dunny, right? 
and there's 31 pages, so uh, they figure, what's the date? Well, I just flicked it open, right? it's the 20, just page 21. If it's the 21st day of the month, I'll turn to page 21, and it says, talking about sexuality with boys and girls. This, whew, you better read that, right? So they look down there, and they find one tip, and it reminds them, and they go out and they do that, right? It's simple tips, all of which work, road tested, and it's a great reminder. So that's the blue book of tips. <laughs> and you know, the Fathering Project is about changing the future of kids, you know, and fathers are more powerful. Like, mothers are already doing a good job, that's why we're not gonna get much benefit from changing them, you know, even though they worry a lot about whether they're doing a good job. But fathers are a lot more variable, including, I'm sure, in here. So we want to change the future of kids, and that's why, you know, simple tips and things that work are what we do. Mm. One, one of the interviewees that really leapt out at me was someone that some may be listening to my voice in this room or on TV or online, may have heard of a guy by the name of Tony Cook. Now, he's, he's been a public face, he's been in politics, um, he was Secretary of the WA Trades and Labor Council, he's been Associate Professor at Curtin Uni, a um, whole range of things, amazing guy. But I remember the first time I heard that Tony Cook's dad was Eric Cook, the serial murderer. And I remember that just went, whoa. And you interviewed Tony. Mm. Yeah, Tony's another good friend, and he's a great guy, and he's a great dad. He's got a, such a heart for people and such a heart for his kids. The thing about Tony is this. I mean, he was eight years of age when his father was hung as a serial murderer, and before that he had eight years of emotional abuse. Right? This is no secret. And uh, he had no other father figures, really, in his life. Tony had some uh, kids, and he decided, you know what, he said, people always make excuses. My dad wasn't much good, so what chance have I got? What do you expect from my... My dad wasn't any good, so what do you expect? You know, my dad was any good, so how the heck could I possibly know how to be a good dad? Tony says, you have to break the cycle. You have to choose to break the cycle. You cannot blame your dad. You have to get out there, work out how to be a good dad and get on and do it. And this is my view. If someone like Tony Cook, with a dad like his, can do it, there is no excuse for any other dad. Break the cycle, no matter what your dad was like, learn how to be a good dad. I remember when you were... Um, in some of your interactions with people, because um, a part of you which is fully integrated with the rest of you is the fact that you're a believer in God, a follower of Jesus and so on, and have been for many years. And I remember at one stage you, you went in one of your visits to Indonesia and you were asked to, to have a chat, speak to a group of um, Indonesian dads. Um, and it was going great because they wanted you to speak to them like you were speaking to Australians. But then partway through, <laughs> everything changed. What happened there? Well, I sort of accidentally dropped a clanger. Um... Yeah, so I was in Indonesia on business, in Surabaya actually, and they asked me to talk to a few hundred Muslim dads in this room, and they said, just give us your normal fathering talk, which was sort of jumping between Indonesian and English. Um, anyway, um, I got to the point, they had a break at half time, just before I got to half time in this thing, I got to the point where I was talking about unconditional love. I said in, in uh, Australia, we talk about it's important in a competitive environment to love your kids unconditionally. For example, if you've got two kids and one's good at school and the other one struggles, in the process of helping the one that's struggling, it's easy for that child to think you don't love them as much. You would only love them more if they got better at school. And if you do the wrong thing, which is to use the smart kid as bragging rights, which is parents should never use their kids as bragging rights, but if you do, what do you think the other kid thinks? So I explained that uh, we, we talk about loving kids unconditionally, regardless of their performance. And I talked about sport. I talked about behaviour. One kid's, you know, school prefect, the other one getting into trouble all the time. I've been down that road. Getting called up to the deputy principal's office. Um, you know, one kid's pretty, one daughter's pretty, the other one isn't. And I said, and regardless of what you believe, I mean, if you believe a certain thing and then one of your children decides not to, as happened in my family, like one of my kids, it was like a black cloud descended on the room. It broke for half time. The organiser called me over and said, that was not the right thing to say. In Islam, you cannot suddenly decide you don't want to be a Muslim and you're going to change to be a Hindu or a Christian or something. It doesn't work like that. This is, this is not a social thing. This is actually Islam. It's a social kind of contract, if you like. And this absolutely emphasise, this is no criticism of Islam at all. 
You know, I do a lot of work in Indonesia. I have dear friends in the biggest Muslim country in the world. It's just a difference. There's a difference in how you see this particular issue, unconditional love. Anyway, so I thought, I don't really want to ostracise these guys, but I don't want to back off from the principle. I mean, I think you get a sense of what I'm talking about. If you've got a kid who's one of kids who's smart and one kid who struggles, you'll sense what I mean. Maybe it was you when you were a kid. So I thought, I don't want to back off from this. And after all, they have asked me to say what do I say in Australia. So I took a different tack and I stood up and I said, look, I understand that what I said about uh, unconditional love might have not sat well with you know, people. Let me just say that this is not an academic exercise for me. I said my, one of my children has decided to go his own way and he's decided that he, uh, he doesn't believe what his mum and his dad believe and I had to decide, do I love him the same or not? And I said, my wife and I decided we're going to love him exactly the same. Exactly the same. Anyway, it seemed to work and afterwards I said to the, I said to the organiser, was that okay? He said it was fantastic because you spoke from the heart. And the thing about it is, the, the notion of unconditional love, of course, comes from Christianity. And again, I'm not trying to be critical of Islam. It's just that there is a difference. There is a difference. You know, when the son of the, the, the prodigal son came back, remember the prodigal son had spent half of his dad's money. I mean, imagine if your son went and spent half of your entire estate, wine, women and song, and came back, and he asked, he had a deal. Remember, he had a deal on his head. He's going to cut a deal with his dad. He's going to work in the farm, in the slops, for, you know, whatever it is, 10 years, to earn his way back into the family to make up for the money. And I was always taught, make your kids take responsibility for their actions. If it was me, I'd have been standing at the gate, looking like this. And as he made his speech, I'd have said, fair enough, take responsibility, 10 years, I'll cut you down to nine for good behaviour. Um, but it seemed like a good deal. His father runs out and hugs him. And he starts his speech, the father cuts him off. Won't even let him finish. That's the core of Christianity, unconditional love. Un we call it grace, but it's unconditional love. And it is the core of, of our being. And if we can bring it into our fathering, and mums for mothering as well, to love your kids and make sure they... They know your love does not depend on their performance, that there's nothing they could do, nothing they could do that would separate you, your, that would destroy your love. Nothing. That is a wonderful thing. And that was that moment in Surabaya when that contrast came up. Now, you've been a follower of Jesus for quite a while now. And, and interestingly, when I mean, you came to faith in the midst of, you know, the scientific enterprise and so on, but I remember when we chatted and had lunch, um, at the end I asked you, you know, why are you still a follower of Jesus? Why are you still there? And you sort of smiled at me and you went, that's because I'm a... bit mad. A bit mad. <laughs> you want to describe that? Well, this bit mad is my code word for this. Um, my brother has a great... My brother Ian, who's much smarter than me, has a great question. He says, it's not why did you become a Christian? Because that's so long ago and all sorts of different things. But hey, every morning when you get up, you don't have to be a Christian. You're not in jail, you can leave any time you like. So why, do you, why are you still a Christian? I thought about that quite a bit. It's a great question. Why am I still a Christian after all these years? And bit mad is my code word for that. Bit, B-I-T, stands for because it's true. From my point of view, even as a card-carrying scientist, science is no threat to Christianity. In, in a lot of ways, Christianity is a better answer to the science and the nature of the world than than atheism. I mean, if, you, if you're a scientist, you know about the anthropic principle and cosmology and stuff. I tell you, it's hard to escape the fact that Christianity is a pretty good explanation for the way the world is, design. And as someone who studies the human body, I am absolutely even more convinced of that. So because it's true, that's the bit. But the mad, from bit mad, stands for it makes a difference. M-A-D makes a difference. So we talked about fathering, Hayden, right? So I have gone out and talked to many dads. There is no doubt, I don't say this in a secular forum, but Christian dads are way ahead. They are way ahead. It makes a difference. Christianity makes a difference in parenting. It makes a difference in marriage, to be able to live in grace in marriage. It makes a difference in the workplace. You know, it's made a big difference to my life. So... 
while there are lots of theological things, why am I still a Christian? Because, and why should anyone else be a Christian? Because it's true, right? It's got to be true, otherwise it's, you know, it's got to be true. But it makes a big difference, you know. I mean, I don't know, Christians, they're just, um, oh, here, here we are talking about it now. We're talking about fathering and parenting and unconditional love. All these people that go away, you know, right? so it makes a difference because, and touched by the Spirit of God to soften your heart towards your kids and then to have the courage to, to have the courage to admit you're wrong. I mean, that's at the heart of Christianity too. We call it confession and repentance. I talk to dads out there. I say, uh, how are you going as a dad? Oh, what's the point of thinking about it? You know, you just do what your dad did and uh, can't change it, so what's the point? They don't want to go there. They don't want to look at it. Same in marriage. They don't want to look at it and admit they're wrong. But as a Christian, you can't get away with that. We call it confession and repentance. You have to be willing to examine yourself and change. And Christians do that by the power of God to change. And that is, I think, why it makes a difference. Why am I still a Christian? Because it's true and makes a big difference. I have a sense of what my life would be like without it, and it's kind of frightening. Oh, isn't that great? Thank you so much for your time today, Bruce. Why don't we say thank you as well? Thank you.